on Energy Superheroes. Today we have Enrique Lendo, and he's calling in from Mexico City. Enrique coordinates the Sustainable Finance Program for the UN Environment. Really cool role. And in his role there, he's helping banks and insurance companies evaluate climate risk, among other things. So we're really excited to have Enrique on the show today. Enrique, welcome to Energy Superheroes. Peter, it's great to be with you. Thank you very much for having me. So really cool. You're the first guest we've had on that works for the UN, which is obviously a broad reaching organization. And I'd love to learn how you ended up there. How did you get to work at the UN? I'm an economist by training. And then I did environmental policy masters in the U.S., uh, in the Indiana University, Bloomington. And ever since I've been involved in both economics and, and then at the masters, it, had, it has been my dream to work internationally for just to make impact in the international sustainability agenda. So after I finished my master's, I worked a little bit in, in Washington, D.C., and then joined the Mexican government in about 2000. In particular, the uh, International Affairs Unit of the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources, which I be, be started from the beginning, and then I became the deputy minister of that unit. And I had the chance to negotiate pretty much most of the environmental, climate change, and sustainability agreements that we know today and that rule the sustainability agenda from all the ones of the United Nations Convention on Climate Change, including the Paris Agreement, the United Nations Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. With the U.S., we did, for instance, the MEF, the MEF, which is the major economist forum on energy and climate change, which is a group of about 25 countries that emit 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions and also represent 80% of the GDP. And I did the G20, OECD, the World Bank, a lot of the trade agreements, including the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, the USMCA, and I did environmental component from that. So mainly my, fo my focus throughout the, the years has been the policy level and the link with the international agenda and framework. And after I'd seen it, my, my job at the government, I, I joined a private company developing climate change and sustainability projects in Mexico, finding business opportunities. And in 2001, the UN invited me to coordinate this project, which is, I believe, a great opportunity. Wow. So that's a long time going back to 2001. I'll bet you from 2001 till now, you've seen a lot of changes. Definitely a lot of changes. I think one, one in particular that I would like to highlight, Peter, is a lot more participation from the private sector. Back in, in 2001, actually, it, it just doing from the private sector perspective, at least in Mexico, doing something on the environment was a nuisance, if you put it badly, or an accessory, if you put it more politely. So really didn't make a difference whether you were engaged or not in the climate change. Regulators were loose or not as strict as they should be. And enforcement, at least in Mexico and many other emerging economies, Economies wasn't that strong. So companies didn't care that much. They didn't find business opportunity by engaging in this agenda. But things have changed enormously in the past seven, five to seven years. Basically, huge progress on business opportunities for companies, financial institutions, financial regulators have also joined this, this new trend. And the context is totally different now. The companies are reacting there to emerging and larger risk in both social and environmental. And within the environmental part, climate change is playing a big role on that. But they are also finding opportunities, a lot of opportunities, investing projects from renewable energy to clean energy to other sectors like water, 
biodiversity. We just had, for instance, a new framework on, bi on biodiversity approved uh, two days ago in Montreal, Canada, and that provides a basis for more projects in the forest sector, in the in in west wetlands, coastal areas, sustainable agriculture, and many other interesting areas for business. And this was unimaginable back in 2001 when I joined the Mexico government. Being an economist and trying to promote all these ideas, but the momentum wasn't there. So I'm really happy to be leading this, uh, this moment, this process of transformation for the business sector, for financial institutions, and also for governments. No, I think that's amazing. So I, when a lot of people think of the UN, they may be thinking in terms of helping to drive government policy and regulation. But I think now we've started to see a lot more of government investing in some of these solutions, at least in the United States with the Inflation Reduction Act, we've seen a lot of that. What role does the UN play in driving policy around these types of grant programs or investment programs in, in environmental opportunities? There, there are two, may, maybe two areas that we can talk about, Peter. The first one is for sure, developing knowledge, like the project leading here in Mexico, we're pretty much developing knowledge based on the best practices available, both outside Mexico and also within Mexico to guide financial regulators, but also banks, insurance companies, and pension funds. And that has to do with building capacities because uh, it's not, this is not a level playing field yet as some countries are more advanced than others. And if they're integrated, in the international uh, trade and um, investment markets like the U.S. and Mexico are, you need to build some capacities in the, in, a, in the countries that are not as advanced as others. So that, that part, building knowledge and building capacities about different actors is one part. And that capacity is built both in government officials and talking about, in this case, the financial regulators, but also private, private entities, banks, pension funds. Uh, insurance companies and equity funds and some others. And the, the, other part, the other part has to do with funding. The United Nation is the house of some of the major public, finan fi public climate change and environmental funds in the world. And we're talking about the Global Environmental Facility. We're talking about the Green Climate Fund. We're talking about many other funds that are housed within the World Bank, for instance, the IDB. And that plays a big role also to the risk investment. I'm talking about private investment here and also to provide technical assistance to specific actors so they can structure projects and then present those projects to, to different investors. So that, that would be the other part, the reported part of the United Nations. The United Nations big thing is a, an agency that probably involves, I don't know, 25, 30 different agencies. My agency is only one of all the other ones, but some of them are specialized in trade. Some others are specialized in social issues. Some others are specialized in financial issues. The World Bank and the IMF are part of the United Nations family. So you got pretty much everything. And the idea here is to make synergies between the different uh, pro programs, capacities, and mandates from agencies in order to push certain objectives. And no, that, I think that's really interesting. On the investment front, when it comes to some of these funds, could you be more specific in, let's say, what the process is for becoming involved in using these kind of tools within say, an overall project finance type of a scenario? Yeah, let's, let's talk about, the, uh, for instance, the GF, the Global Environmental Facility, which is a fund that uh, has about, I don't know, that forgot between seven to 10 billion. And that's for all the world, mainly emerging, emer emerging and developing economies, which are the ones that use these funds. The other one is the Green Climate Fund. And that one has a little over $10 billion and for periods of uh, four to five years. And the way they work is you have a focal point in the country. In Mexico is the Ministry of Finance. And that focal point is part of the work of each of these funds. When a replenishment of resources is announced, then the Ministry of uh, Finance announces that there are these resources and there's potential for 
stakeholders in Mexico. It can be private, public, government to present projects. So there are some guidelines. First of all, you present a project a proposal, then you present a bigger, a bigger proposal, and the Ministry of Finance selects those projects and then bring them to the board. But what they've been doing in the last years is to link the acceptance of the project or the go ahead of the project to matching funds. So that's when the either government or private capital plays a role. So for every dollar you get, you need to put at least two and in some, in some cases up to $5 per project. You usually have to have a blended finance project in which you get the grant, but in order to get the grant, you put some uh, budget, public money, and some private money or grants from, from in national NGOs and some other sources. So that's pretty much the way it works. When it gets accepted, then you get into the implementation phase. And Mexico has been one of the most successful countries submitting projects to, to these two funds. I think we were ranked about four in terms of, of projects presented and money assigned to Mexican projects. And no, that's very helpful. And it certainly makes sense to have some sort of match because then that way the project has to be further vetted by private capital in order to have access to those kind of public funds. It makes a lot of sense. Maybe could you talk about Mexico's being very successful in this way? Maybe a project that, that you think is particularly notable that's been successful through the, in Mexico? Yeah, maybe many of the projects and these grants are usually used for developing certain capacities. Since there are grants and the projects are not that large, we're talking about projects that don't go beyond five to $10 million. So you cannot finance infrastructure with, with, with that. In order to finance infrastructure, you need to pretty much get debt or equity. It's, it's hard to use these funds in order to, what you do is either feasibility studies, if you're going to then build, let's say a solar or a windmill project. And, and this, these funds would give you the money for the feasibility study and all the preparatory process. So for that, we have done a lot of feasibility studies for projects in the, in the energy in the sustainable or clean energy sector. We have done a few of them also in the water sectors, but some of the ones I like a lot have to do with thin capacities at the government. And many of the projects have been useful to, for instance, set the basis for Mexico's NDC. And if you're familiar with that term, it's natural determined contributions, which is the climate change plan that every country presents every five years. Now it's more that not more every year than five years. And the, that plan presents their emission reduction target to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. So the funds from this, the, the, uh, the money from these funds, from the GF and also from the Green Climate Hub Fund have been useful to build capacities in order to structure these this NDCs and also some of the reports once you're implementing the NDC, like the biannual report or the national communication, which present all the progress that Mexico has in implementing the convention and the Paris Agreement. No, very good. I, that's helpful. So you mentioned the Paris Agreement and you hear lots of things, both good and bad around the Paris Agreement. What are some of the things you like about the Paris Agreement? And what are some of the things that you think could be done a little bit differently? I think that the best, uh, the best thing about the Paris Agreement is that it is based on science. It took us about what the United Nations Convention on Climate Change was approved in 19, I'm sorry, in, 20, no, in 1992. So we're talking about 30 years ago. And it took us until 2015 to set a temperature increase stabilization goal, which is based on science that we developed for those many years, but we weren't able to present that, that specific target. So, because that target gives you a guideline, it gives you a guideline on what you need to do in order to stabilize the temperature at that 
a specific level. And that guideline is a certain percentage or a certain amount of emission reductions in terms of, of tons or percentages or however the countries want to put it. So I think that's the best part is, is an agreement, which is solid on science. That, that sounds easy, but it took a long time and a lot of work for many scientists to reach the, from the IPCC to reach that specific target. And then it provides some other guidelines on how to reach that target. So it provides a, a guideline on mobilization of resources. It provides a certain guideline, although not that good, talking about the things that I don't like that much about the Paris Agreement on adaptation, because in adaptation, we neither a solid guideline on how to adapt or how to adapt or what is good for adaptation, neither in parties nor in, in the other instrument that we have adopted after parties within the United Nations Framework Convention. And we don't have a very strong signal either on finance for adaptation, for instance. It has always been an unbalance between the money we put in mitigation and the money we put in adaptation for many reasons. The, maybe the most important one is that uh, adaptation you know, is not always profitable in terms of a return of investment. So it's very hard to have a bankable project that would finance adaptation, although it is not impossible. Other thing that I think we didn't do right is the period to present the NDCs. The beginning, we set a timeline of five years in order to present uh, the updates of the NDC. And as we know, with the NDCs that we have presented so far, we don't read that temperature level goal that we set in the Paris Agreement, which is below two Celsius and the preferable 1.5 Celsius by the end of the century. So we're now at 2.5, 2.6. But in 2000 and 2015, we were 3.5. Some scenarios almost have four. So we have had progress, but the period in which countries have to present their NDCs, which is five years, I believe is too long because our time frame is 2030. The time frame is 2030. You only have three updates of NDCs in order to raise your ambition. And that is uh, clearly not working out. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. You mentioned adaptation. Could you define that a little bit more? What do you, what do you mean by adaptation within the framework? Yeah, adaptation in general, the definition of, of adaptation or the argument behind adaptation is that whatever target we reach, even the 1.5, we're going to have impacts all over the world. We're all actually already having impacts, but we're going to continue having impacts. And those impacts can be very large and costly if we are not straight enough with the reduction targets that, uh, that we present, and I'm talking about all the countries, or can be not as large, but you are still going to have impacts. So in order to address those impacts, economies need to take certain measures to adapt to, 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 adapt to a world which is hotter than the one we have today with more, uh, natural disasters, extreme, extreme rains, hurricanes, floods, lover droughts that will affect both the rural sector, agriculture, and also the cities and many other impacts that are brought by a higher temperature in the world. So you, you need to adapt to that new condition through different measures, one part has to do with government policies and government policies or national and, and also local, especially local. And they have to do with money. So as most countries, including the U.S. and Mexico, have special funds to address natural disasters. So you need to have sufficient money in order to address. But also companies and businesses need to adapt to this new situation. And this is an interesting part because they need to look at risk in a different way. And that's what the project that I'm coordinating Mexico is doing, Pete, is showing is uh, building capacities 
financial institutions, banks, insurance companies, and pension funds to assess those risks, to identify the scenarios that are going to hit Mexico, depending on different circumstances, and then assess their level of risk and the strategies to address that risk. So you have it both in the public spectrum, and that has to do with mainly public money, national, regional, and local funds, and also international cooperation, like the, what happened in Pakistan, well, well, what's impossible for Cap Pakistan to deal with that tremendous flood by itself. So you have international resources coming bilaterally and also from uh, multilateral sources, and that's the public domain, but also at the national level, which is the largest part. But then you have the way companies and financial institutions adapt to this new level of risk by, uh, by physical impacts of climate change. And no, very good. And you mentioned insurance companies. I think insurance companies are incredibly interesting in the whole climate change discussion because, of course, insurance companies are in business to make money. And I've always thought, as you watch insurance premiums, in low-lying areas, for example, I'm in South Florida, so near Miami Beach. We've also seen sea level rise to the degree where Miami Beach put in a pumping station to help mitigate the rising sea level. We get something here called the king tide. And what that means is in October and November of every year, a lot of times the water just rises and comes through the sewers and into the cities. And Miami Beach put in a pumping station to mitigate that risk. But going back to the insurance companies, have, how have you seen insurance companies adapt? And do they have to raise premiums? Do they have to hold larger reserve funds? How are they thinking about it? There are two, two pieces or two processes that are uh, involved here. The first, the second part has to do with raising the premiums. But uh, the question there is raising the premiums to what level? So the way insurance companies have been operated, have been operating for the, <laughs> ever since they were created in terms of, of damage coverage has been with not climate change, but more weather forecasts. Weather forecasts are a forecast that have three to the, the most five-year time horizon. And climate change goes beyond a lot longer beyond that, that time horizon. Where in climate change, we're talking about 20, 30 years, one century, and even two centuries, which are the, some of the scenarios that we're dealing with in, in, in Mexico now in this project. So the first thing that you need to discuss with insurance companies is whether the forecast that they're using is the most convenient in the long term. And they're very interested about this. So they set the prime in terms of those forecasts, but those forecasts are going to work for maybe whatever, those five years, maybe 10 years. But what's going to happen in 2040 or 2050? And for that, they need to look further. And, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're bringing available scenarios for Mexico and pretty much showing them in 2030 where, when, and how is climate change going to impact Mexico, the different sectors, both whether they are insuring a hotel or they're insur insuring condominium, or maybe they're insur insuring a port or they're insuring maybe an agricultural agriculture association or grower with this information, they are certain how climate change or more certain because nothing is certain about climate change. There, there's actually a lot of uncertainty, but at least they have a better compass than doing those weather forecasts and things are changing. So they're very interesting. We're going to start a whole program of capacity building of insurance companies in Mexico to switch from the, uh, this uh, forecasting, weather forecasting towards more climate scenario analysis. No, it, it's very interesting. W one of the issues that I see, I mentioned the pumping stations, a lot of the mitigation related to climate change or adjusting to rising sea levels or other environmental factors 
or even recovering from a disaster like we just had in Florida, a lot of that's driven by actual, by fossil fuels, right? right. So then if you make a pumping station, they run on engines, they emit, they have emissions. Or for example, we had to re, we had to rebuild our bridge and the governor said, let's rebuild the bridge in two weeks, which was an amazing feat to help mitigate the problem that was caused by this storm. But that takes a lot of concrete. Of course, concrete comes from fossil fuels. The question is, what role do you see fossil fuels playing in this whole energy transition? What technologies are you seeing that you think are well balanced, that work well in dealing with the issues of mitigation, then also transitioning to hopefully a net zero future? Usually when we think about the energy and the fossil fuel, especially the fossil fuel sector, you are dealing more with transition risk more than physical risk. Like all physical impacts that we discuss about floods, droughts, and heat waves, and that impact assets, that is called physical risk. And it has its own line of thought. When you, when we think about fossil fuels, you actually picture them as the root of the problem or more than the solution. You place them, not entirely, but you play, usually place them in the transition risk basket. And, and with transition, and we'll go back to the, to, to the other part of the question, but going to transition, in transition risk, what you're looking at is, first of all, are regulators or governments going to implement stronger or stricter policies to address fossil fuels in our countries? And that happens differently everywhere. The U.S., I believe, is taking a different approach, is more putting incentives to boost clean energy than actually penalizing fossil fuels. So that's, but the approach of Europe is different. They're putting a price on carbon and many other, Canada is putting a price on carbon and many other countries. That's one part, but then in transition risk, you also have changes in consumer demand or so consumers going to demand fossils or renewables. And then you have investors. Are investors going to support renewables or fossil fuels? And then you have the society. <laughs> society going to have a strike in front of the, uh, whatever, the oil and gas plant or are going to do, take whatever action or sue them or whatever action. So the, the risk approach to that is, is different. And we're thinking about more about stranded assets, assets that are going to lose value along, along the time. And if, if you have some stocks, either stocks or other assets into that investment, maybe your, that investment will going to lose value throughout the time. So that's the way you put it. But then the other part more close with, to what you said is the vulnerability of the fossil fuel industry by itself. And that's another interesting part, and not also the fossil fuel, but the energy sector in general. So. As we have a warmer planet, how is that going to impact in the energy system? And if your energy system has to do with hydro, for instance, is that going to affect your supply of energy when it gets drouder through climate change? And that's one example, but you can have many other examples in which the energy sector is going gonna, is gonna to be impacted by climate change. And for that, you need take also adaptation measures. And some of those measures have to do with switching to other sources of, uh, of energy, but not necessarily renew. Maybe you can, you'll switch locations or whatever, but you need to be very careful in picking your different options. It's a big challenge for sure. You'll see in Europe this summer where you've got an issue of rapid removal of a large amount of fossil fuel supply without having a sufficient backup. So then exactly. and now it's going to get very cold this winter and they're burning wood and other things that have a worse carbon footprint, for example, than natural gas. So resulting in increased emissions, which is of course the opposite of the targeted goal. And then another one of the challenges is of course, that 
as I mentioned before, you've got these mitigation techniques. And one of the, one of the biggest causes of climate related death, of course, is coal. So we use fossil fuels today primarily to make sure that we're not too cold. Right? We, we don't have that issue. So that I'm a big believer in technology, long story short, because if, if we don't come up with an alternative for things like cement and steel and plastic and these areas that are so necessary, it's very difficult to implement policy. So I'd love to get your reaction to that. Just no, you're totally right. Have to play together. You're totally right. You're totally right. In, in this area of uh, climate risk, and, and for that, you have different institutions that have been working for many years on, on this area. One of them, and in terms of financial approaches to climate risk, which is what we're talking now, one of them is the network of central banks and supervisors for greening the financial system. So those folks are probably the ones that have some of the best studies and approaches for economies for looking at the financial system at large, because that's the work of, of central banks. And when they discuss this, this idea that you mentioned, going from fossil to other cleaner sources, they have different scenarios. And one of them, Peter, and uh, probably what you're referring to is called orderly transition. So if you transit into a new technology or a new policy without being ready for it, it turns into a disaster. So that's true. And we're all hoping for an orderly transition, have the technology available there before you switch and maybe do this progress. But there's a catch, okay? There's a catch. If you give too much leeway, for the transition, maybe you will not reach the target on time. So you need to be careful. It's the, the analogy of the carrot and the stick. You need to balance the, both the carrot and the stick to support. If you give too much carrot, then the players there get a little lazy and maybe they won't advance as, as fast. If you give too much stick, You'll probably, you'll probably have trouble with, with some of them not being helpful or just going out of business. There's, we have a, not within the climate change agenda, another agenda, which is the ozone, ozone layer agenda. And that one was ruled by the Montreal product. So the idea was to fade down all the chemicals that affect the ozone layer that they are depleting the ozone layer. So the way they did is when they met in Montreal as well, and this was like 30 years ago, they decided to give signals to the markets in order to come up with substance to those, to those energy, you know, Ozone depleting substances, that's what they're called. So they needed, they needed some signals to the market. So they said, okay, what we're going to do is in 10 years, we're telling you now, in 10 years, we'll start with the rule. So we invite innovators, we invite technology guys, and we invite entrepreneurs in order to get into the market. And we advise companies that are producing these substances to be ready for the transition. And we'll come back in two years because in two years, you need to reduce at least, let's say, 10 to 20% of the production of that substance. But not only that, we're going to put some public resources, some funding, so you come up with that technology and the idea. So they put a lot of money. The problem wasn't as large as the one we have with climate change, which you pretty much have all the energy system driven by fossil fuels with the, and the transformation is nervous. What we're talking about, I don't know, between five to $7 trillion a year in investment in order to drive this transformation. And it wasn't that large in the ozone deplete, depleting substances, but it worked. That is strategy, that orderly transition strategy worked. And now we produce any more ozone depleting substances. We produce alternative. Which actually one of those alternatives is produced 
is hitting the planet as well. So we need to come with a, with another alternative because we didn't do it. We didn't see it in a systemic way back then. But again, the lesson that we can learn from this is when you do it orderly, when you provide with incentives for the transition and when you provide a, with a timeline for companies and markets to get ready for this is more successful than doing it. Thing is that we, it took us too long to approve parties and also it's taking us too long to reduce the emissions. And the deadline that we have in order to reduce 45% of global emissions is 2030. That's at the end of the quarter. So we need to speed up things. Not kill companies, not leave economies without heat. But we need to advance very fast. It's a challenge. And my, my dad used to always say, repeat the things that made you successful. So I think we were successful in mitigating the challenges of the ozone depletion. I think it's really good that you bring that one up because a lot of people forget that. And everybody seemed to work together. There wasn't the same level of, let's say, political discord in those days as there is now. There's much more of an adversarial of a philosophy, I think that's a challenge because everybody really needs to come together in order to be able to address this problem. Let me ask you about a couple companies that I know down in Mexico that are very important companies to the economy of Mexico. You have CFE and you have Pemex. they are big companies down there. They employ a lot of people. I think just from my perspective, they'll be important in the energy transition. You worked with them, with either of those companies, and what what challenges or successes do you have to share around the CFE is the power grid, I believe, and right. MX is the large oil and gas company. Yeah, I uh, didn't work in, in, in the companies, but I was close to them when I worked for the government. We used to interact in meetings and initiatives and they're big companies. That's the first thing to say. The U.S., you have like many utilities all over the U.S. and some of them are state, other are, might be regional, whatever. In Mexico, and the population of the U.S. is a little over, what, 300 million? The population of Mexico is about one third of that. We're talking about 125 million people. And for 125 million people, we only have one company that supplies the energy. So imagine... The challenge of that big, I don't want to say monster, but it's a huge, it's very a large, huge, company. astonishing, large company that needs to provide electricity. The electricity comes from different sources, mainly fuel oil, because we have a lot of oil. We use a little bit of coal. And then the third one is, I think it's fuel oil and gas. And then we have hydro. We have a lot of kites, about of 50 to 20% of hydro, which is pretty large for an, eco an economy of the size of Mexico. And then we have coal and coal, we have what, five, maybe seven, seven percent and the rest is renewable. So it has a challenge because it needs to provide energy security and that's important for the country. But at the same time, their sources, their sources are not that clean. So it needs to think about its strategy in order to transit towards net zero and they have a implemented, they don't have a net zero strategy so far, but they have a vision of adding more and more renewable energy. I believe the target that we had, and the, we set this target about 10 years ago was to reach 35 of ener 35 percent of energy from clean sources. And you can put everything there, renewable, hydro, and also natural gas. Coming, yeah, 35% in 2024. That's what we need to reach, which is a pretty, a pretty good target. And in order to do that, they will either have to give more opportunity for uh, renewables, or we have a very significant solar potential that has not been developed, but they just invested in the largest solar farm, solar energy farm, actually in Northern Mexico, in the state of Sonora, the one that borders with Arizona in the U.S., it's going to be the largest solar farm in Latin America. Pretty big. 
And we're even thinking about well, supplying some of that energy to the U.S. because in the Mexican part, we don't have a lot of population. In that, in that area is mainly desert. But then if you cross the border a bit, you have Arizona and you have Tucson and you have Phoenix and many other important urban areas in the world. So we might work in, in a deal to supply some of that. But I think they, they need to advance faster. Okay. And they should definitely give more opportunity for private providers of energy. And that stalled a little bit, have stalled a little bit for the past three, four years. So they need to get on track again and provide permits to private investors because they're not going to be able to do it by themselves, the government. Well, because they, these two companies that you mentioned are government. And then Pemex. <laughs> Pemex is more, more complicated. I think the challenge with Pemex, and I'm not going to say the problem, but I'm going to say the challenge with Pemex, because we have used that in a, let's say it in a practical way. What we do with Pemex, we tax the heck out of Pemex in order to finance the federal government. So all, from all distraction, selling the, the, those oil barrels, we tax about 35 to 40% of the revenues, and that goes into the national budget. So that is financing pretty much payroll of all the federal public servants that in Mexico, we're talking about, if you bring in all the teachers that also belong to the public sector, we're talking about over 2 million employees being financed by the resources that you extract from payments. So if that is the case, the question goes back to you. Do you think they're going to be competitive or able to improve their efficiencies or invest in new technology or go and find new fields? It's going to be very hard. So Penix needs to reinvent itself and decide whether they want to be they want using the money where to finance the government and the, go the government, they finance a payroll and also some uh, public investment. It doesn't actually show a rate of return. So the way we think about oil and gas in Mexico is more in terms of how that sector is supporting national priorities set by the government. And that's broad, you know, but, uh, you name it, education, health, whatever, some infrastructure, environment, agriculture. And the other part, which is important also is energy security. So if you have a sovereign company, you can use the resources of that company for the purposes of Mexico more than for the purposes of other countries. And to close the loop, not, all, not only that, in the past we would export oil to US, mainly to Texas. They would refine the oil in Texas and then send it back to Mexico in gasoline and diesel. Now we don't want to do that anymore. We're investing in refineries in Mexico. So the oil space in Mexico. So we're going to close the loop and the whole picture is going to be within Mexico for, uh, both for, uh, for gas, for energy security, gasoline and oil or sovereign resources. And also for using that money in order to finance the government and payroll. Is that questionable? No, I don't get into that. That's the decision that the government and maybe Mexicans do. Maybe as an economist, I would say that is not too recommendable. That there's only so much oil that you can use in order to go that way. It's going to come to a, to a, to a, to a, time when uh, it's not going to be feasible to do it. And of course, it's very indebted now, Pemex, and it's hard to refine us. It's, it, these are not easy questions. It's what makes this whole challenge that we face so exciting is that it takes a lot of people. It's different in every country, a lot of technologies, and there is no easy answer. And I think you walking through Pemex as a case study is an example of that and that in every different country, there's different scenarios like that it makes certain companies and certain industries very hard to abate or very difficult in terms of 
thinking about energy transition. That's for sure. We've, we're almost getting to an hour here. We can go on limited time, but I would say before, <laughs> before we get all too far into it, I want to ask you, is there anything that I said or asked you about any message that you'd like to get out to the audience? Okay. The floor is open if there's anything you'd like to cover. Yeah, thank you. It's been a very good talk, I believe. Peter, and I appreciate the opportunity. Maybe something I, I like to say is that uh, indeed, EGS trend, environment, social, and, and corporate governance investment trend that we're facing all over the world, the U.S. for sure. The project that we coordinate in the U.N. is uh, the aim is to set the basis to make that trend more efficient and more significant for Mexican actors. We work with both financial regulators and also with private financial companies. What we've seen is that Mexico is ready to engage into this trend. Every other week, a new green or sustainable bond is issued either by the government or by, by a bank or a company. It was two or three weeks ago in a room of banks full of banks wanting to learn about climate change scenarios and what they represented in terms of the risk management strategy. So you had about 60 banks in there with people wanting to learn more about it. And that was surprising by itself. But then I talked to a few and I realized that those people in the room were hired to in some cases, three years ago, is specifically to take that role within the bank. So that was unimaginable in Mexico 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago when I started working for the government. So things are changing. They're changing fast. Of course, private companies and financial institutions are taking the, those steps because they see an opportunity and also a lot of risk if they don't if they don't switch, that's one part. The other part is we're an integrated economy. We're integrated to the U.S. 80% of our trade goes and comes from the U.S. That, that's important. It's our main trading partner in the world. We're also the largest, the largest source of foreign direct investment. So financial markets are also partly integrated. With Europe, we have also a lot of trade, a lot of investment, and some of the emerging Asian countries. So this is probably a sector or a segment of the economy, which is going to make the difference in order to reach the Paris Agreement, in order to reach some of the sustainable development and SDG goals, and also in order to meet some of the national priorities, because those goals have to do not only with reducing emissions, but also with having a more efficient economic system, more efficient economic system, which is where energy is cheaper where energy is more diversified and where also you provide some opportunities for social development, poverty alleviation, biodiversity, resilience, and many other factors out there. So that's the reason the UN environment is concentrating on this project in Mexico. We're very happy and very honored to work, as I said, with financial regulators and also with, with private financial Institutions were helping them with the climate scenario analysis, the stress testing, which is a methodology that more and more banks and pension funds and also central banks are using to analyze and address climate risk. We're also helping the Ministry of Finance to develop the first sustainable taxonomy. So we're going to address the greenwashing and other threats that are out there in this new trend of, of EGS all over the world. And we're very honored to help the Ministry of Finance. And we're also helping them to apply more efficient tools for climate fund. We were talking about climate funds, international climate fund mobilization. Through electronic platforms, through aligning their pipelines to their resources, to aligning pipelines our resources to the national priorities with the taxonomy. So a lot of things, a lot of good news to mention in, in, in Mexico. I, we feel positive. Mexico is going to be one of the winners in this new transition. And I'm very glad that you 
gave us the space to share all this excitement heater. And now, Enrique, it's been my pleasure. And you mentioned Mexico. I don't know if a lot of people realize how booming Mexico City is. It's just a vibrant place and it's amazing. So I know you live down there. Talk about what you love about Mexico City and maybe give people some insights on what they should do in Mexico City. It's, un it's an unbelievable place that's just, it's booming and wealthy and successful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks for saying that. B, that's the way I pretty much look at it. I've been living here in this city for many years. I've seen it grow, but I get one important part is its culture. So let's remember that Mexico City was built in a lake, in a lake, first of all, but a lake that was inhabited by the local Aztecs. We call them Nahuatl civilization. It's the same, the same thing. So you have a lot of, a lot of archaeological monuments, pyramids that you can visit both in Mexico City and near Mexico City. We have one of, not one, probably the largest anthropology museum in the world and one of the best anthropology museums in the world that has all the, gives you a, an idea, a good representation of all the Mesoamerican culture, not only the one in Mexico, but the one in, in Central America and other regions of, of Mesoamerica, the North and South. Food is great. A lot of places to eat, not only Mexican food, Mexican food is good. And you have very worldwide recognized chefs or as we call them food outers. So. Go visit the neighborhoods of Polanco with great restaurants from all the cuisines. Be visit the, the neighbor of Asa and Roma with very nice uh, and cheap places to, to go eat and have a drink. Many other museums, there, there is a uh, theater place, many plates all over the city. There's music and from music, you can go classical music, opera, and, and more pop, modern music, jazz. So there's every shopping malls and it's a large city. We're talking about 15 to 17 million people in the city, a large city with, that has a lot of, a lot to grow. And so come visit. Now it's absolutely true. I would say I've been all over the world and it's one of the top, if not the top food cities in the world. A lot of people don't realize the sophistication of the cuisine in Mexico City is unbelievable. So I totally endorse it. And that's for sure. Enrique, it's really been a pleasure having you on Energy Superheroes. We've had Enrique Lendo, and he coordinates the Sustainable Finance Project for UN Environment out of Mexico City. And it's really been a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Enrique. No, on the contrary, Peter, thank you very much for having me.